Welcome to chapter four of the research methods course for exercise. All right, so today we'll talk about developing a research proposal. All right, um, it's one of your most important steps in research process because you don't develop it, you don't get it approved, you don't get to do research, right? Um, and so again, you've got to come up with a good idea of what you're going to do and how you're going to go about doing that. So good characteristics of a research proposal, you want to talk about what you wish to investigate, right? So again, um, this seems like this is kind of a no dub, but you would be surprised to see how many times I've worked with folks on trying to develop a research project and they're just not very clear you know a, a lot of times they, they know what they want to research they're just not cool, like completely clear on what you know like exactly what it is or how they want to go about doing it or they don't think about you know sometimes some folks are clear but they don't think about you know okay well if you do it this way you're not controlling for a b and c and if you don't control for those things how do you know if what you're doing is actually making any difference, right? And, and so a lot of times, um, there's a lot of things that go into this, right? And, and you gotta be very clear about what you wanna investigate. Well, I present a compelling rationale as to why the proposed study should be conducted, right? So why is it important to do that? Now, are you adding to a certain body of literature? That's important. Are you starting something brand new that you know, is it has some importance to society? That's important. Um, are you going to research something that really, you know, just, all right, well, that answers that question, but it really doesn't add to anything, okay? Um, and again, we saw that in chapter one, there are some of those studies out there and there's some that get funded with lots of money, right? Um, you want to explain how you want to conduct this study, right? Because again, there's an idea of, what you want to look at and then there's okay well how do we figure that out okay um and what are we getting control for all right so how how do you plan on conducting that study you know is it going to be ethical to do it or not all right and that's going to be important we'll talk about that here in a minute well, um does it project what the results are likely to be and why they will be important all right so you have an idea if you do this what the hypothesis is what direction is it going to go you know are you looking to show a difference between something or are you looking to show a null hypothesis where there is no difference right um include a budget for the projected costs associated with conducting the study again some research is costly you need equipment you need to entice people you know Sometimes um, subjects get paid to be in research, sometimes they don't. Um, you know, equipment needed, you may need disposable equipment, like if you're handling blood or other bodily fluids. Um, you know, you may need a lot of protective gear, disposable, uh, you know, disposable gloves, disposable gowns, whatever it is. Um, those are all things that have to be added into the budget. Um, and then you gotta explain why those things are necessary. Nope. Why are we spending money on these things? Okay, so who's got to approve the research proposal? All right, now, and they kind of go in a weird order. I'd actually start at the bottom of this one. The advisor and committee need to look at it first before you go to an IRB, right? And again, um, you know, they're there for a reason. So this is only for students, but again, I want to work, you know, in the order of, you know if we're working with students or not so if we if you're a student you're going to take this to your faculty advisor he or she's going to look at it and say all right this is a good idea let's move forward or they're going to give you some revisions okay or if you're trying to do this and in fact you can't find anybody that's really interested in what you want to do sometimes you will have a faculty advisor that will say that's cool but you know, right now, I think this is a more important thing to research. Now you have a decision right then and there, you know, are you going to keep pushing forward with what you want to do? 
or are you going to do what the faculty advisor suggests? Now, I'm gonna give you um, a little bit of advice here. Um, I know a lot of folks when they're going into their thesis or their dissertation, they feel like that particular project is going to set the direction of any other future research that they're going to do, where it's going to be, you know, like the uh, crown stone that they, you know, or crown jewel or something that they're going to, you know, set their, their uh, rest of their career on. Um, it's not that. And again, I'm gonna. Um, I, I got this advice when I was in my PhD program. I'm gonna pass it on to you. Um, when a faculty advisor, somebody who is going to be with you every step of the way and is either going to be on your side or they're gonna fight you on it, do what they ask you to do, even if it's not necessary. It's necessarily the interest that you wanted to do your project on. They, they advise you in some other direction. Go with it. Look, you're trying to get this pass through and graduate, right? Do what they ask you to do. That's that simple. Okay. Um, and I can attest to that. I did exactly what my department chair told me to do. I came, I can't even remember what I was wanting to do at the time. My faculty advisor said, you know, that's cool, but I, let's take a different spin. Let's go in this direction and do this project. And uh, I thought at the time, well, it's not exactly what I was wanting to do, but okay. Um, I will say that any time that we had, we were working with my committee and there was any dispute on any type of legitimacy, he was the first one to stand up and argue sometimes before I even had a chance. Um, made my life so much easier. So please listen to your faculty advisors and your, you know, and your committee members because they are going to be the ones that are going to approve or disapprove a lot of things that you're doing, especially when you're trying to get your thesis or dissertation done, right? Now, if you are a professional, you will write up your proposal and you'll send it to the IRB or Institutional Review Board for permission to conduct a study. Why do the IRB exist? To make sure that what you're doing is legal and ethical and in no way are you causing harm to anybody, okay? And again, granting agencies, you know, if you're looking to get a grant, um, again, um, wrote a proposal years ago for an energy grant um, where we hooked up some cardio equipment to a uh, energy grid. Um, which kicked it back into our system um, at our fitness facility, right? Um, again, as is cool grant, uh, you know, we got, uh, you know, um, tens of thousands of dollars to um, upgrade our equipment. Um, we got this, we got this hookup that went in our gym that we could hook the equipment to, um, and it, it registered how much um, electricity and watts that we were creating, was putting it back into the electrical grid, back into the actual facility. Um, you know, again, it was, I had to make sure that, I had to make sure that it, um, sorry about that. I had to make sure that the funding, so when I wrote it, I had to write it to explain what we were doing, how it, related to what they were trying to fund and make sure that it was a good fit. Okay, and there's a lot of funding out there for all kinds of different research. Um, purpose of research proposal, provides an action plan for conducting the study. Um, again, you wanna have a plan because you can get lost in what you're looking for. Um, and I've seen this a lot of times where, where somebody's like, Oh, yeah, okay, I want to see the difference between this and this. And then, you know, they start talking with other folks or they're just telling this. But there's, you know, there's this, this, and then there's this other thing. You know, what, what if I compare all three or what, you know, you start adding all these things, which makes it very um, complex. And again, sometimes when you have, and you create a research proposal and you create this action plan for conducting the study, it's real easy to get lost down some rabbit hole. Again, stick to simplicity, okay? If there's other questions that you want answered, there's more studies to be done. 
to answer those. Okay, you don't have to answer every question regarding, you know, like protein supplementation in one research study or creating supplementation in one research study. You know, it, it, it'd be foolish to even try. Okay. <clears throat> Again, the proposal also helps to serve as a contract between the researchers and those who approved it, right? Because sometimes you may have some thoughts of, okay, I want to change this, this, and this. Well, if you've already got this approved, it's already run through the RRB, you got to run it the way that you said you were going to do it, okay? If you're going to make any changes, you have to notify the IRB of any changes you want to make and see if you can get approved for those changes. All right. Check your understanding on that. So strategies to identify top of the area. Again, talk to the faculty advisor if you're a student. Um, talk to other uh, graduate students that you might be in school with or um, you know, at some schools like Nova, they do it in their undergrad as well. Again, read research literature. Right, so if you're thinking, hey, I want to do something on like a protein study, go read all the protein studies. You know, make sure you're not doing something that's, you know, make sure you're answering a new question, right? Yeah. Why go do the research on the same thing where it's like, yep, I found what they found. Okay, again, it needs to have a different take on it, right? Um, and, and I know a lot of times when people read research, they feel like, okay, there's a lot of the exact same thing out there. Um, and maybe sometimes, you know, that does happen because there are some, there are some uh, journals that maybe you don't scrutinize enough. And like I said, a lot of journals may come off as being good journals, but they're not peer reviewed and, and all that. So make sure that you're looking into that. Um, but again, you can go, you know, if you look at a journal like the, the, the journal of the ISSN, um, you know, you may find a lot of different things on protein supplementation. Um, you may see how it affects bodybuilders versus basketball. You know, there might be one on like, you know, it's affected basketball players. It's effect on folks losing weight, gaining weight, maintaining weight. Um, you know, folks that are going through maybe cancer treatment and try not to lose as much, you know, have as much muscle wasting or atrophy. You know, there's a lot of different protein studies in a lot of different settings on a lot of different people. That doesn't mean that there's not room for more protein studies. Okay. Um, and again, you, when you're answering something new, that's interest to people. Okay. Again, you think about that. You know, if the first ones I mentioned in the last one, you know, if you were a cancer patient and you're going through chemo and everything and you know that you're going to lose weight and the doctors are telling you that and you're wondering well you know how does protein supplementation help me maybe you know if i if i can try to do maybe some type of you know uh, protein supplementation is that going to help me to maintain some muscle mass um you know or is it not going to do anything you know that would be of interest to you because all the other things when you're looking at okay how does it affect football players basketball players baseball players soccer tennis whatever how does it affect people losing weight well that one okay that one sort of kind of relates to you how does it affect people that are trying to gain weight okay that one's not affecting you know like i'm sort of in this boat but these people are doing a poor deficit um, you know, and working out and doing all these things, you know, my body is now going through this chemical process. I, there's going to be days that I'm most likely not going to work out. I'm going to be sick, you know, feeling sick as a dog, those type of things. And I'm losing weight because I don't want to eat. I'm throwing up and all that. How does it affect somebody in that state? Right. And so again, that makes it a very important question to a person like that. So that's going through that. So again, that's an important thing to answer if it hasn't been answered, right? And then again, somebody may see research on that and somebody else going through another um, disease that might be similar where they're, they're going through a time, you know, they're taking medications and things where it's like, hey, you know, I'm not gonna feel like eating or I'm gonna feel sick or whatever while I'm on this, but I'm not, I don't have cancer what about this right and, and those are good questions and again you know just because you know like maybe you look at another disease you know say the, you know like you've seen enough research on cancer and you think okay well this other disease also most people tend to lose weight when they're going through treatment and everything else 
um, you know, but it's not cancer. You know, there's a lot of research on cancer, but this one's different, right? And so again, that's a that's an interesting subject, right? So again, sometimes people think, you know, well, we've answered this one quite a bit. You know, there's a lot of on caffeine and creatine and protein. Not everything's answered. And if you've got a good idea that, you know, a good question, you, you scoured the research and you can't find something, that's an important question to do, okay? Um, so again, you, you know, you go through the research literature, you look at it, you find that you've got this niche, this new idea, man, that's amazing, right? Go to conferences where research of interest is being presented, you know, and if you get a chance, talk to the folks that have done that, and, you know, maybe you ask them, like, damn, think about doing something on this, and they're like, wow, you know, that, you know, I haven't even thought about that, you know, and I work with a lot of folks, and we talk over all kinds of different things, and that's really interesting, okay? And again, sometimes you might find some help in that, too, because um, some folks may have a lab facility and just have access to people. They're like, yeah, you know, I'd love to help you out. Okay. So again, um, a lot of good, you know, a lot of good things to look at there um, on creating the topic area and how you want to divide. Um, again, your faculty advisors are valuable sources of helpful information. And like I said, if they tell you they want you to do a certain project, you know, or steering in a certain direction, you need to listen to them. Because again, they are going to be your strongest advocate when it's something especially that they're super interested in and they now take a vested interest in the results of what you're doing, okay? Um, and sometimes what may happen is, is you may end up jumping on something that they're doing Right, and so again, we, um, you know, it, it's hard to sometimes find faculty advisors that are going to be 100% open to, you know, like, all right, you want to do this? Fine, I'll, I'll uh, I guess I'll advise you on that. Right, they usually have some ideas of, of what their the research that they're wanting to do, you know, um, or some funding that they they come across that they could get for a certain idea, right? So the research question or problem statement serves as the focal point for the study. All right, so again, you're trying to answer this question. You're trying to, to um, some extent, show that this has an effect or that these two things are, you know, are, are basically, you know, you can do A and B and it doesn't matter. You know, there's a null hypothesis. Either one's going to get the same results, whatever you're looking at, okay? You want to identify your independent and dependent variables, right? So... The independent variable is the one that you're going to manipulate. The dependent variable is the one that's going to change based on that manipulation. Um, and so that's one you want to, you're going to be measuring to see what changes. Um, and you may have multiple um, dependent variables and independent variables in studies, um, you know, depending on how many things we're looking at. Um, and again, should be of interest and importance, right? Don't do something just for the sake of doing it. All right. So characteristics of a good statement. It's novel. It has not already been answered. All right. We've already talked about that. It can be a variation of something that's been done many times, but that particular question hasn't been answered. Let's answer it. Is it researchable? It can be addressed through the collection and analysis of data. Right? Can you, act, you know, like if you do it, can you actually analyze it and look at it and come up with a conclusion if you do? Okay. Is it practical? Do you have the necessary equipment or with grant funding or anything else, can you get the necessary equipment? Do you have the expertise or is somebody working with you have the expertise, you know, to use either equipment or do part of the study or whatever you need? Um, you know, access to participants, you know, will you be able to get enough people for the study and the right folks for your study? And time are all available, right? So again, you know, how long do you want this to be? Is this some type of longitudinal study that's going to go on for 10 years? Do you have time to do that? Or is this something that you can do within a matter of a couple months, you know, and then pop things out? Again, you know, if you're doing this for your thesis or your dissertation, longitudinal study probably is not something you want to even be thinking about, right? Unless you're like, ah, I don't mind working on my PhD for the next 10 years, okay? Um, 
clearly stated, written in a straightforward, readily comprehensible manner using appropriate research writing. Again, people try to write very complex. People try to write in roundabout ways. And sometimes you're reading something and you get, you know, um, you get those like double negatives, you know, where it's like, do not not do this. <laughs> now, instead of just saying, do this, they say, do not not do this. Okay. Say what you got to say. Okay. Make it very straightforward. This is what we are doing and this is what we expect to see okay timely one that addresses a current problem or issue right is this something that you know you know like looking at things now you know there's this time issue of them trying to figure out a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus right and we're all wondering okay how long is it going to take them to do that you know or things going to open up prior to that and all these other things going on that we have questions for right now we're all sitting at home okay um and for proposals um submitted to funding agencies in line with the, the priorities of the funding agency right so again you know people sometimes question you know well you are funded by this well that's you know, the, the thing you got to understand though, a lot of research is always going to be funded by somebody that has interest in the research, right? And, and so a lot of times people go, well, that was funded by, you know, Big Sugar, or that was funded by the, the soda industry, that was funded. Well, that's because they have an interest in what you're going to find. That doesn't mean that the researcher is, you know, pocketing money and they're going to spew just whatever results again that's you know if it gets published in the journal the journal is going to really look into that and say okay this does this is not congruent with what other research and similar things are finding more than likely this person's getting a kickback from that particular industry you know or that particular company right um and again you know it's it's not in the best interest of the researcher to do that but there's not a problem with taking funding from those places because they have that interest. And again, you've just got to be straightforward with them. Look, what I might find might not be in your best interest, you know, or what I might find might be in your best interest. Okay. You know, I might find something that says, yes, you know, soft drinks, um, you know, soft drinks don't contribute to, um, you know this disease or that disease or or you might find yes they are a, a big contributor to this particular disease you know whatever is found that's what i'm going to come up with and and you know you've got to understand that right and so again um you when you're doing your proposal and you're putting all this stuff together you know don't write to a funding agency to get funding and kind of be like well this is what we're looking at and then when it comes time for you, you know, actually putting pen to paper and getting IRB approval and all that, you do something else. Now you've got to stick to what you told them you were going to look for. Okay. All right. So master's thesis, 50 year old longitudinal study, right? Um, again, you know, if you want to do a longitudinal study, that's something that, you know, if you're a professor or researcher, it's something that, you may look into doing um, you know you may have this thing like I want to see how um, artificial sweeteners really contribute to, you know if they contribute to anything over a time so I'm gonna follow some folks that you know tend to you know like they have a lot of artificial sweeteners in their diet and we're going to keep track of all the other things they eat and so on and so forth and see how that plays into anything that happens to them over the next like 20 years that's a novel idea excuse me for research but it's not a good idea for a thesis or dissertation right this is something that you know again this is something i guess i could do but at the same time i'm probably going to be doing a lot of other things you know in the meantime with research right i'll look at some other short you know like a lot of other short-term studies because again publishing something over you know doing a study over 20 years and then spending, you know, hopefully less than the next year after that, compiling and putting everything together and getting it written up. Um, you know, you're looking at 21 year study when it's all said and done, maybe even longer. 
is not something that you want to be waiting on to get your diploma. Okay. Then check your understanding. So research hypothesis. So researcher, this is your expectations as the outcome of the study, right? So the researcher has some expectations. And um, it's based on understanding of the research problem. So again, if you're doing something completely new and there's nothing else out there, you know, it, it's really based a lot. You know, I guess here's the thing. There are some things that, you know, that I guess you could be studying that are so outside of the box that there's just not much to go on other than like gut feeling. Now, most of the time, you're not going to see something like that. Okay. Most things you're going to say, okay, we've done this, this is similar, we saw these results. And then somebody else did this, this was similar, you know, and they saw similar results, so on and so forth. So we're doing this and it's different. But we expect some of the similar results based on that, right? That, that's what most research hypotheses look like, okay? Um, so based on the understanding of the research problem, analysis would have known from related research literature, you should have a certain expectation. Um, I have seen people that, you know, basically disregard everything done before, and they have this hypothesis of, now we're going to see something different than what previous studies have done, you know, on, on the, a similar subject. Um, you know, and again, it, it's really, you know, most times it's not a really good research hypothesis because, you know, it, for example, you know, somebody wants to put, I think the ketogenic diet is, you know, more superior that there are other things that happen besides, you know, if somebody's in calorie deficit to make the weight loss happen. There. Um, well, there's no research to support that, right? So if you have a keto diet, a low-fat diet, Mediterranean diet, and all these other diets, head to head, everybody in the different groups is all eating 1,000 calories. They're all doing the same workout, so on and so forth. So they're in a certain calorie deficit. They're all around the same amount of calorie deficit. You're going to see all three, four, five, however many groups you're looking at, they're all going to lose weight. And you're not going to, you know, as long as they're, the calories are counted right and all the folks in the study are all somewhat similar, you know, like you've got a good spectrum in each group, we're going to see basically the same results, okay? Um, as long as they all complete the study, I guess that's the thing too, but, you know you're going to see the same results because it is. We know it's a calorie deficit, but there are some people that still believe like a certain diet has some magical formula plus the calorie deficit, which means that they're going to get some superior weight loss. Okay. Um, and it's really not based on what we've seen in all the past research. Right? It's just some personal feeling they have. Okay. Um, or some pseudoscience they've read. Um, and again, it falls directly after the problem statement, right? So the problem statement gives the mixed findings of previous literature, the primary purpose of the current study. So again, here's what, everything we've seen on protein, or here's everything we've seen on creatine or caffeine or whatever else. And here's what we want to do, okay? So again, you know, this one says, here's all the literature. The primary purpose of the current study is to test effects of acute aerobic exercise on long-term memory. So maybe they've looked at folks that have been doing aerobic exercise, you know, for a year or more. How does it affect long-term memory? Maybe they've looked at anaerobic exercise on long-term energy. Maybe they've looked at both chronic and acute exercise, or, um, anaerobic exercise on long-term memory, but nobody's done acute aerobic, right? So here we go. We hypothesize participants engaging in acute exercise would perform better on a recall task than those not performing any exercise. And again, it's probably going to be based on a lot of other literature showing how the cognition, you know, your cognition and your, your ability to recall things, maybe um, in folks that exercise all the time or in different exercise protocols that are not aerobic. You know, um, so looking either at chronic exercise or acute other forms of exercise, we see this. We expect we'll probably see it in the aerobic exercise as well, right? 
Um, scientific games, two or more related research questions, problems being proposed for investigation in the same study. Um, again, so sometimes you may have a research idea and you're going to do it, and somebody's like, you know, I was going to do something similar to that, but instead of looking at this, I want to look at this. So maybe somebody's, you know, like, um, you know, say you're doing some type of fatigue study, right, and you're looking at something with, uh, you know, how it affects, you know, so this is something that I did in my thesis. I was looking at fatigue um, and its effects, um, both aerobic and anaerobic. And um, well, actually my study was to look at fatigue and see the difference in biomechanics of how somebody does a landing, right? I was, I was doing a, bi a biomechanical um, force study. So I was looking at, um, we were using a goniometer to look at the change in measurement of knee flexion um, after somebody was fatigued when they land off a two foot platform and see the difference between when they did it prior before they were fatigued and see if they're folks that either try to land, you know, because people, my thought process is when you're fatigued, you overcompensate in one to two ways. You know, you're either going to try to land straight so you produce more force that goes through your body or you get folks that are going to actually, you know, have more flexion in their knee. So then they overbend when they do things. And my thought process is in either one of those, those could be a mechanism for injury. So again, it was shown that, you know, fatigue is a, is a major contributing factor for athletes getting injured. Okay. Um, so that was what I was looking at was just whether or not they bend at the knee or on the force platform, if they bend a lot at the knee, it takes away, you know, how much force they land on the ground. Or some people that do the straight leg, which again, you know, either one of those is overcompensating in a bad way. Um, you now have this jolting force that, that now vibrates up through your bones and your joints because you didn't bend enough, right? Um, and, you know, what I saw before is people had a nice mix of not bending too much you know, and landing nice and, you know, having a nice soft landing um, without bending too much when they're not fatigued. Okay, so that's all I wanted to look at, right? Well, and uh, uh, one of the ex -fizz guys realized what I was doing, and he wanted to see if there's a difference between aerobic fatigue and anaerobic fatigue. So we had this subject come in, you know, like one time, and they did an aerobic fatigue. Um, protocol the next you know gave them a couple weeks they came back in they did an anaerobic fatigue protocol and see if there was a difference between the two um, the two fatigue protocols and if that made them do anything different in their land right well there's another individual who wanted who wanted to see the difference in potassium in the blood in the same um, subjects when they do anaerobic and aerobic. So guess what? He jumped on it too. So there was multiple folks that had some specific aims that um, were, you know, was, that were in this, this study, you know, that they're like, hey, you got these subjects coming in doing this. So, you know, we, we all had to go through these IRB processes, you know, of, okay, this is what this study is doing, this with this, and we're using all these same subjects, you know, and get those all passed through, okay? Um, so again, they were similar, but they all had their own specific aims that they were trying to answer. Okay. So specific aim one is to determine the effects of 30 second, 60 second, 120 second static stretches on ankle range of motion after zero minute, 10 minute and 20 minutes. Hypothesis of this one is ankle range of motion will increase with increased stretch duration. Specific aim two is to determine the effects of 30, 60 and 120 static stretch on plantar flexion, peak torque after zero minutes, 10 to 20 minutes. And the hypothesis for that one is plantar flex and flexor, not flexion, plantar flexor peak torque will decrease with increased stretch duration, right? So again, they're going through the same study, but one person's going to look at measuring the range of motion at the ankle. The other person's going to look at um, plantar flexor peak torque um after going through the same protocol so there, there's two different measurements going on okay like mine there's three different measurements going on okay 
All right. So again, check your understanding. So the rationale for the study introduces the topic, makes it clear why it is of importance. You know, here's what we're doing, this is why we're doing, this is why we think it's important. Okay. I want to explain how the study results will fill a gap in related literature. Right? Like I said, there's a lot of stuff on protein, a lot of stuff on creatine, a lot of stuff on um, caffeine. There's a lot of stuff on resistance training. There's a lot of stuff on aerobic training. But there's always something out there that has not been answered, right? And so somebody, you know, says, well, okay, we've seen aerobic training is good for this, 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 and this. But how does it affect this person under this, in these circumstances? Well, we might not know because nobody's ever questioned that, right? Um, and so, you know, let's look at it. You know, and, and sometimes the thing is, is, you know, you or somebody you know, um, fills that gap, you know, when they ask you that question, you know, um, hey, is this good for somebody that has, that's going through this illness or this disease or something like that, and you go through and you scour the literature and say, you know, that's never been answered. Well, here, you know, based on what we see, we usually see these positive effects in most people that are healthy or we've seen that in get positive effects in these folks that have this disease or this illness, but your particular illness, we don't know. So what do we do? You can do a study, right? It fills the gap. Leads the reader down a path that ends with a clear understanding as to why the study should be conducted. Now, why is this important? Okay, it ends with the problem statement or specific aims. Okay. Well-written introduction leads the reader down a path to convincing them that this is an important study that needs to be done, okay? So again, rationale for the study. Is it invaluable to begin work on the rationale with an outline of the main points you wish to make, All right? And the rationale is not a full-blown lit review, okay? So when you're doing that, you know, when you're trying to propose it to your committee or IRB, you're not writing your full on lit review, you're doing through your dissertation, okay? Um, you're just using enough of what's out there and closely enough related to what the specific thing is. So again, let's look at creatine. You know, all right, well, we're looking at creatine with um, maybe pre-diabetic patients, okay? So again, we wanna look at how maybe Creatine has worked in other disease populations or something like that, um, you know, in, in its effects or whatever. Um, so you're not going to go over every study that's been done on creatine and its effects, you know, its, its positive effects associated with like exercise and everything. We're looking at creatine exercise and special populations of folks in, in certain like metabolic diseases or something. So that it says, okay, now we want to look at that in type 2 diabetics, okay? Um, so again, very decisive, very direct and relevant to what you're doing. All right, methods for the study you need to be careful and detailed and comprehensive, all right? Again, you've got to spell out every little thing that you're going to do in your study. You know, everything from your participants, how you're going to select them, who are they, where are they coming from, right? What equipment are you using? Which models? What year are the models? So on and so forth. Um, you know, you're using a questionnaire. What are those? You know, which ones exactly? Okay. Um, how you're going to do it. So participants, you know, walk them through like day one, you know, like day one participants come in, they fill out, you know, they fill out their consent form, so on and so forth. From there, they're going to take off their shoes. We're going to measure them. After we measure them, they're going to get on um, a bio bioelectrical impedance. We're going to get their body fat percentage. From there, they're going to do a warm up. From there, they're going to do this exercise. Um, you know, we're going to during this, we're going to tell them to do these things during the exercise. We're going to measure what happens, right? So here's our pretest. After that, they're going to come back a week later, and we're going to give them the supplement, whatever it is. Right? Um, so you have to go through all that very detailed. Level of detail should be such that another competent researcher can use your methods and be able to do your study. Without, you know, like without them actually being there witnessing you doing it, you're so detailed, you know, you hand this over, they could walk into your lab that day and run the exact same thing that you did. 
okay? And written in future tense and in a proposal. So again, this is one of the things where you gotta make sure, because um, you'll write your methods and everything else. Um, when participants come in, we will do this, this, and this. You know, and so you write that, everything gets approved. You can't just copy and paste that into your methods when you're writing up your, your thesis or dissertation because it was all in the future. Now it's got to say participants came in and did this, this, and this. Not they will do this, this, and this, right? So future for the proposal, past tense for the thesis, dissertation, or research paper manuscript. Okay, so you've got to change the way it's written. All right, so description study participants includes means and standard deviations of all important characteristics, often including age, height, weight, body mass, as well as other relevant variables. What, why were people either included or excluded, right? So if you're saying, hey, we wanted 18 to 35 year old healthy adults, right? And people that have not been identified to have any disease, one, Exclusion criteria would be anybody outside of that age range um, or folks in that age range that um, maybe are not healthy, right? They have um, a disease you excluded out, right? Um, inclusion would be anybody that's in that age range without a disease. Okay, that, that's, I guess, lives within the area that can um, do your study. And a statement assuring that all participants signed informed consent documents, right? You're not doing anything on anybody until they consent for you to do that. All right, so again, check your understanding. All right, so describe the protocol, including everything participants are required to do. So is there any prep work they gotta do before they come in the lab, after they come in, everything they're gonna do while they're at your lab, so on and so forth. Who's gonna collect the data? How are they gonna collect it? When, where? Um, and where's it going to be collected? Um, also, where's it going to be stored? How's it going? You know, how's it going to be coded to protect the the rights of the participants? Um, all that's got to be written in there. Operational definitions describing context-specific details were necessary for terms and problem statements. Okay, and detailed description of all apparatus, which is your equipment and instruments, which would are questionnaires you know so you gotta explain out what it is why you're using it you know um, why that one was chosen if there's multiple things to choose from um, other protocol components assumptions made by the researcher about what the participants do or do not do limitations that are unavoidable right um, there there's always going to be limitations and that you cannot control for everything okay um, and so again, you know, a limitation might be that, hey, we told them what to eat when they're not here, but we're not there to babysit them 24 hours a day. So there's possibilities that, you know, they're eating more calories than what they're reporting. There's possibility, you know, like you got to account for all that. Okay. And the limitations that set the boundary conditions deliberately chosen by the researcher, right? So there's you set up these boundaries so that you can, can try to uh, contain and not have extraneous variables. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, okay? Um, but again, you want to set boundaries. All right, reasons to conduct a pilot study, determine which dependent variables are important and practical to measure. Okay, so again, if something's very, especially if it's very, very original, and, and you want to see, okay, well, if we do this and we measure this, you know, what are we going to find? Are we going to actually be able to even measure it, right? So you do a pilot to see if you can. Learn or practice conducting the procedures, right? So again, if you have a team of researchers, it's a good idea to do it because people may have to get handed off from this group to this group to this group. And again, you want to make it seamless and airless. And so again, it's a good way, it's good practice for all the researchers. Again, determines how long it'll take to test each participant, right? One of the things is, is people coming into the study, you know, it's, uh, hey, this will take about 30 minutes, and then four hours later, they're still there, right? So again, you want to see how long it's going to take so that you can tell them, you know, this takes about four hours to do, okay? Again, you want to make sure that when you do all this and you can collect data, is this actually going to help answer your research question? 
And again, you need to figure out how many participants are going to be needed so that you have a good enough effect size to really answer the question. Okay. A proposal title captures the reader's attention. At the same time, it needs to accurately, concisely convey the essence of the proposed research problem, right? This isn't like the title of a book sometimes that it's like, you know, it's like, ooh, that sounds cool. And then you get into it, you're like, why is it even name this? Right? Where it's like, oh, okay, I kind of see what I mean. No. Again, you want it to get your attention, but at the same time, you know, I'd almost said Singapore is the more important because, again, when other researchers are looking for something, they're not so focused on, ooh, that sounds catchy. They're more focused on, okay, I'm looking for something on how caffeine affects cyclists. Okay, this says caffeine in cyclists. There we go. Right, you could have some other fun stuff in there that captures their attention, but um, again, that's you know the second part's more for, more important, I think. Um, journal impact factor, okay. So again, the IRB, you gotta get approval through them. Animal Protection Review Committee, if you're gonna do that. Um, funding sources, faculty advisor and committee, um, and again you know, how many folks are gonna be using that research in the future um, to, uh, you know, use maybe a nerve lipid deep, right? And then subject to understanding. All right, that's chapter four. Any questions or anything, just email me, let me know, write on the discussions in our Blackboard, and I will do my best to answer those um, in a timely manner, and that's it for this one.